coming to you from the My Little Falls studio here in beautiful Little Falls, New York. It's your host, Scott Kinville, and another episode of Marty's Illegal Stick. Hey, what's up, hockey fans, and welcome to episode number 33 of Marty's Illegal Stick, recorded here on July 6th, 2021. So a couple of real quick things I want to go over first. Um, Number 33, that's the namesake of our show, Mr. Marty McSorley. So uh, hopefully he's listening somewhere, and a big shout out to Marty. But uh, (laughs) before we get going, though, I want to uh, offer my sincerest condolences to the family of Matisse uh, Kavlenkis who was tragically killed in an accident the other day. Uh, It was apparently a firework had gone wrong and they were trying to get out of a hot tub and he slipped on the concrete and hit his head and he uh, ultimately perished from the injury. So our sincerest condolences, that's just an awful thing that happened. Uh, So anyways, um, back to, back to the show here. Um, We got a very special episode lined up here. This is a, being in upstate New York, the uh, the Eastern Hockey League is very near and dear to all of our hearts, thanks to uh, our Clinton Comets, which uh, if anybody's heard of the Eastern Hockey League, they know the Clinton Comets. And what we've done, we have brought in a panel today to talk about some stories of the old Eastern Hockey League. And without further ado, I'm just going to bring them in. And by the way, I want everybody to know we're going to do a little bit different of a format of a show because – this show is going to be one gigantic Zamboni time machine. <laughs> so <laughs> the Zamboni is currently in Jimmy McNeil's Zamboni repair garage. It's going to be there for the week. It's going to be parked. So, <laughs> so without further ado, I want to bring in our panel, our guests. First of all, sitting right across from me, as usual, my co-host, the guy who rides shotgun with me every week, Gump Leo Kinville. What's going on, Gumper? Hello, son. How you doing? Uh, I'd like to play a little hockey, but it's a little humid out there today. I couldn't get ice today. This afternoon, I tried. I think if we took a puck out there, it would melt. <laughs> yes, you got that <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> probably not a good idea. And joining us for now, anyway, he has to leave in a few minutes. But it's Dave the Save Warner, our producer. Yeah, but I had to get you started. Yeah, well, but, uh, you're gonna you see me in blonde hair here in a few minutes on the screen. So, <laughs> well, that's okay. That's a, <laughs> I'm not even gonna comment on that. Yeah, like that. <laughs> no, don't. Or we'll, we'll we'll play the clip of, of you playing the other day for these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just there, you go. Here we go. All right. Yeah, my wife is gonna fill in. So beautiful, perfect. Yep. All right, and from the rink of dreams, joining us once again in a co-host capacity, Mr. Barry Shelley. What's happening, Barry? Hey, Scott. Nothing much. Looking forward to the show. Absolutely. This is right down your alley. It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but I was don't just go- uh, messaging uh, Tom earlier. I picked up a Juicy Devils t-shirt, which yep. doesn't look too good online, but once it gets there, <laughs> it's going to go up in the rink with all the other EHL merchandise nice very nice so speaking of tom tom talar he's back he was uh here a few weeks ago uh he runs the uh the ehl.com website uh he is something of an expert on the ehl and he is also the 2021 winner of the brian mcfarland award for the society of international hockey research tom thanks for coming on hey thanks for having me i'm 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 excited to uh be on with these guys tonight um uh I heard about Rocky for many years, and I, I'm just um, I, I want to get off and let him him talk, and I want Terry to talk, and uh, I want I want to hear what these guys have to say. All right, well, let's do that then. So first of all, I'm gonna, I'll introduce Mr. Rocky Ruvini. He was a uh, he was an original Philadelphia Rambler from the '50s, so yeah. he's joining us via phone. Rocky, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. Very good. How you doing tonight? Very good. All right. <laughs> Can't ask for better. There you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also joining us tonight. Hey, look at that. There's a perfect picture of you right there. That's Rocky. awesome. I wish you could see this. That is great. I'll see the replay. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> and also joining us tonight, this guy is just Mr. Hockey. Uh, he sent me his his resume of the different uh, teams and leagues and programs and everything else he's been a part of. And and I told him, I says, well, I'd read your whole resume, but that would take our whole hour. So <laughs> I'm going to let him tell us a little bit about himself. It's Mr. Terry Mulvey. Terry, thanks for coming hey, on. Hey, Scott, thanks for the uh, discussions. But uh, I'd like to also uh, also congratulate uh, Tom on his award. And, uh, of course, Rocky is a senior man here. 
And, uh, <laughs> I go back, uh, starting back in the New Haven, uh, Greater New Haven Pee Wee Hockey Fathers Association, 1953. And I also stickboard in the Eastern Hockey League at the New Haven Arena for opposing teams between 55 and 60. So I'm sure Rocky and I came across to each other as he was a member of the Ramblers at yeah. that time. Cool. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Rocky, what were some of your early memories from the Ramblers? Well, uh, I enjoyed being in uh, Philadelphia. As you know, uh, I was there for four years and I had a good time. I, I hated to leave, but uh, I, I guess things have to come to an end sometime. So I had to come home and start all over again. Hmm. Yeah, I mean that was, but that was just such a, a special time. So I'm assuming that how long were you there? I was there four years. Four years. So 1955 was the first year. Nice, very cool. So uh, I'm I'm assuming you made some trips to Clinton. Clinton, you used to make some trips to Clinton. Oh yes, I, I had many trips to Clinton. <laughs> I thought I was at home when I went to Clinton. It was very cold. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got news for you. My rubber boots. <laughs> the arena is still open, and guess what? In the winter, it's still very cold. Nothing changed there. Trust me, I play there. <laughs> yeah, Scott, there's a game I'd like to ask. We enjoyed it. Absolutely. I'd like What's to ask here? Rock. Like to ask Rocky a, a game he might remember. It was probably around the '57, '58 season, uh, and during his term with the Philadelphia Ramblers. And I was stick boying at that time. And uh, the greatest fight I've ever witnessed in hockey, and I've been involved in hockey for 50 some odd years, was uh, when Ray Leacock, who was a Canadian prize fighter, was brought in by Don Perry for the New Haven Blades. And he went up against a rookie with the Ramblers called Ted Harris, who many of you know went on to a great career. And they had the fight that you can't imagine. It was a center ice they went toe to toe, both benches emptied around the, the red circle of center ice, and the fight went on for five or six minutes, with one blow after another, exchanging shots, and it was the most amazing fight you'd ever see. I, I wish you could actually get, capture a video of it, but I don't know. How. Rocky, do you remember that? I remember that fight. I had many a, uh, a run in with Lee Cock. He, he was a tough hockey player. I made sure that I, I had him in front of me and not behind me all the time. <laughs> well, you were a tough little cookie and yourself. I, mean, you, I, I recall I, you being a very small, compact guy that played the win, and uh, you were tough to knock, right. off your, knock, knock off your wheels for sure. Uh, but, I, was uh, course, five foot four. I was five foot four, but with that hockey stick, I was five eight. <laughs> oh, I, remember, I remember going in the, under the armpits of Don Perry and Ray Crew. That you just to be able to see him to cruise right by them. Well, Don Perry and I used to meet in the center race. And I remember one time I was coming in and we were all ready to, to hit each other and he ducked. I thought I was on the 474 there for a while there. I was going through the air. <laughs> I still have a sore shoulder from that one. Wow. <laughs> the memories that always last, right? Yeah, I never forgot that one. <laughs> and he's passed away since. Yeah. Well, you had some tough times when you came to the New Haven Arena. Uh, from your bench, if you look down towards the State Street and down to your right, that Section 13 down in the corner gave the closing goaltenders the hell at the time you had uh, Ivan the towel Wamsley playing for you, if I recall, and they used to ride him from the right. stop dropping the puck to the end of the game. Do you remember those days? I'm sure. Yeah, I remember that one corner there. I I was trying to. Someone was bugging me there while I was playing, and but I couldn't get a hold of them because there was a wire in between. Yeah, and he sure gave me a goal that day. Huh. Well, that's the trouble that we had back then. You had the chicken wire around, and they threw everything besides beers and hot dogs and mustard and ketchup and everything else at you. It wasn't pleasant yeah, to get in the sure. ball in the corner. Yeah. Same way in Clinton. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, and they also didn't uh, nail the chairs down either. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, no, sorry, guys. I was just uh, Jeremy's uh, having some technical difficulties, so he's not going to be able to join us tonight. But that uh, we'll get him back next week. So, so, uh, so, Rocky. Any any other early uh, arenas that you particularly remember? Any particular games? Pardon? Any uh, particular arenas or particular games that you enjoyed? Not enjoyed going to? Um, had a harder time than others? Well, I enjoyed Charlotte. Charlotte was a nice arena. And it was always mm -hmm. packed, so you, you had somebody to play in front of. Uh, Washington wasn't bad. Uh, New Haven was a, a good place to play. They had good fans that were really there for the New Haven team. And I guess they thought I was Italian in those days because of my name, but I was Croatian. <laughs> so they always cheered, cheered me on for, for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> the joke was on them, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you re you recall Rocky? You re recall Joe DeLeon, Joe Dillett in the Haven Arena? I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> he was uh, the Italian guy that ran the concessions for that Haven Arena from I think from the day it opened till the day it closed. <laughs> <laughs> it's so long ago now that we we more or less forget them, but they're the ones that really yeah. were doing the big job there for the arenas. Because that's what happened to me. I ended up running an arena, and I know what it went through. Really? Which arena was that? In Capus Casey. Well, when I come back home, Casey, I became yeah. the recreation director, arena manager for the town of Capus Casey. No kidding. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah. I went back to right, school yeah. and got my, my papers for arena manager and recreation director, so... At least it gave me something to look forward to, you know, instead of just being a laborer in some little job. Sure, sure, yeah. absolutely. Oh, that's great. Oh, that, that's that, that is that's really great. Did you uh, did you happen to play for any other teams besides Philadelphia, or was that just the Ramblers? Well, I just played for the Ramblers. Okay, I was supposed to be traded to uh, New Haven one time, but it, it didn't pan out, so I stayed in. Oh, really? Out. When Kirk Frenchy went to. New Haven, he wanted me to go there with him. But I stayed in Philadelphia. Hmm. All right. Well, that's that's interesting. So, how, Rocky, how did you end up in Philadelphia in the first place? Well, I went on a, on a holiday in uh, Niagara Falls, and I met uh, Chirp Brentry, one of his guys that works with him. Chirp was giving tours in Niagara Falls, and he told me, we all had our hockey jackets on from campus casing. And he said, we have a guy here that's a coach and we don't know where he's going, but he's looking for hockey players. So he says, come back this afternoon. Well, I went back and Chirp asked me to go to training camp. And that's how I ended up in Philadelphia. There you go. Chirp was the original coach of the Ramblers for those who don't know. He was a good coach. Mm-hmm. Now, what did you think about Doug Adam? Good hockey well, player. Well, Doug Adams and I, I guess we didn't get along too good. That's why I ended up coming home. Uh, I didn't get the chat. Like, if you look at my stats in the last year, they weren't as great as the others because I never had a chance to get on the ice sometimes. Huh. And that's when I met my wife in the summer. So I guess that because both those things, that made me decide to stay at home. There you go. There you go. Rocky. Rocky just, oh, I'm sorry, Barry. Just uh, real quick. Rocky, for our listeners that, are, that don't know, what position did you play? I played right wing, left hand shot. All right. Very cool. So I'm sorry, Barry. I didn't mean to cut just you off. like don't... the Rocket Richard. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Good comparison right there. <laughs> um, Rocky, I have a question. I've talked to a couple former EHL players and um, I don't know if it's true, but they always told me when they went to a visiting arena, some of the arenas would cut the height of the bench down lower than the home um, team players sat on, and it was impossible for them to stretch the legs out, and sometimes they'd have to stand up. Did you ever find that while you played? Well, I, I don't remember that, but I remember coming into Philadelphia and having the the board's about uh, four feet high and then a fence above that. And when you played in, in our area, the boards were always about six feet high. So 
you couldn't get hurt. But when you start hitting those posts and the steel posts Ooh. and the Ooh. fence, that's what was dangerous, <laughs> especially for yourself being short. Yeah. Well, and people forget, too. I mean, the, the equipment that you guys were wearing back then is nowhere near as protective as what we have today. Well, no helmets. We didn't have no shoulder pads. We, we wore the, the least. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Let me let me see if I can get a picture of that. Uh, Actually, I know Terry was saying earlier that he's got uh, he's got some uh, equipment on. He wants to show right there. Here's a pair that uh, I wore in 1962. Oh, oh man! <laughs> oh, wow! My goodness, yeah. that's just unreal. I wore these in I wore these for two years in junior hockey in Windsor, Ontario, in OHA. Oh, but these, wow. uh, these actually, I went to. I was signed by the New York Rangers, and I went to the Guelph camp. The Guelph Royals were in the OHA, and uh, of course, they issued you all your own gear. The only thing you ever brought was your own skates. So uh, these were issued to me, and I wore these for two years for juniors. And uh, you'll see the names on them. I'm the third recipient. The first one was Jean <laughs> Jean Rattel right here in the corner. Really? Ah, wow. The second name on here is Donnie Very Grosso. Donnie Grosso's name oh, is the yeah. second one. Yeah. And then, then my There's name is the over, my name Rampart. is put my name's over here on the other side. Uh, but cool. that, see Donnie and uh, Donnie and Rotel, those guys played in Guelph. And uh, the next time I saw Donnie Grosso was with actually with the uh, Jersey Devils. Right. And uh I reminded him, I said, geez, I said, I got a pair of shoulder pads that were two years of juniors. He got a kick out of it. <laughs> and just so everybody right. knows, that this was, was a an upgrade. This was actually an upgrade before a couple of years before that. We only wore the shoulder caps. This part here was sewed to your suspenders, and that was it. Wow. You, didn't have, you didn't have any protection here in the breast or the collarbone. Right. If they, right. Came, wow. they, came out, they came out with these. Probably around that 1962 era, they started making a little bit better shoulder pads. Nothing what they compared to what these kids wow. are. No. no, now they look like knights in shining armor. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> of course, the weight of the equipment was outrageously heavy then, too. We, right. It was heavy felt. And uh, I mean, I picked up my hockey pants. You know, they weigh, they weigh 35 pounds. These kids today, you can pick them up with <laughs> one finger. <laughs> and that was before you started sweating in them. <laughs> Here's a pair of skates I wore in 62. Yeah. Wow, look at those. Yeah. Those are yeah. CCN Tackaberries. Uh, yeah. Quite yeah. different to what the kids yeah. wear today. So these were from 62. And you can see I liked a lot of tape on the back of uh, around my stockings. Yeah. But sure. This was kangaroo hide. Of course, in comparison to the plastic they wear today. And the fact we had an all steel blade. Yeah. And I was a centerman, wow. so. As a playmaker, you always rockered the front of the blade so you could turn quickly mm -hmm. and make cur curves and uh, turn very quickly. The, the toe job on the front of it was discovered by a guy who worked for the New Haven Blades. His name was uh, uh, DeMeo. He ran a leather shop on Clown Street in the New Haven Sports, and he designed this to go over and protect. It was a hard surface to protect and not denting in your toe. And the Rangers ended up bringing them to New York, and he worked for the New York Rangers and did the same thing and sharpened their skates for many, many seasons down in the old wow. garden. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is the you know this is the type of skate you wore. Of course, it's all steel today. They don't even have hardly any steel on a blade today. No, they don't. I had a pair of those. Yeah, you did actually. Yeah, yeah, mine I from ten them. years later, are pretty similar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you, you didn't have I anywhere had, near the I had a couple support. of hockey bags, and my son said, Dad, pull some of those hockey bags. There's probably mm -hmm. something in there you can show them. So. Oh, man, that is great. Yeah. That it's is good. great. So, plus, Terry, just to, you didn't play with the curved sticks either, did you? No. Really no. Straight, so you didn't have that many high shots. Slap shot really wasn't a thing until Bobby Hull really started to come forward. Boom, boom, Jeffrey on. Those yeah. guys kind of perfected it. It was funny because and uh, in the old arena, and, of course, a lot of the Eastern Hockey League ranks at that time, they had steam uh, heating in the locker room. So they had these big old radiators. So the players, once Hull developed it, they would dip their stick in water, yeah. and they'd stick it in between the radiator. Mm -hmm. 
and they turn it and curve the hockey stick. That's how Bobby Hall actually started wow. to make the curved hockey stick. Uh, he was the first one really to perfect the, the curved stick. Of course, he didn't know where his shot was going, but he, <laughs> he could score 50, <laughs> score 50 goals in a season. Didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was, well, he was hitting the deck, the net was wide open. Like, yeah, I'm I'm say, this ain't worth it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but that the Northland Pro is basically the stick that was used yep. at that time. Very true. They, they were a big manufacturer. And then uh, in the Haven, uh, actually, uh, they went to a Wally hockey stick. Wally was made in Wallaceburg, Ontario. In fact, when I was playing junior hockey, we went to Wallaceburg to play a, a Wallaceburg Junior Hornets. And, of course, hockey night in Canada is Saturday night, and it doesn't matter what league you're playing in, the stands are full because that's what everybody does on Saturday night in Canada back in those days. And I'm sure it still happens up in Rockies area even today. But uh, they'd fill the rink up. And, and I was wondering, I said, everybody that was in attendance worked at the Wally Stick Factory. I said, we got to go there. So we had a layover <laughs> that night. We ended up going over to the factory. And I bought a half a dozen sticks for 25 cents a piece. Oh, wow. And sent them back to my brother. And, wow. Uh, and a few years after that, uh, there was a fellow that coached at AIC College in, in, in Springfield. Uh, he also played for the Blades back in the in, in the t- in the day, named Joe Buckholz. And Joe yeah. got the yeah. franchise. Joe got the franchise for Wally Sticks in New England. So he had a truckload. I was good friends with Joe, so because uh, I had friends of mine who played for him. But when he when he was the coach at AIC in Springfield. A uh, good friend of mine was Donnie Brazel, who was a goaltender who I played high school with. Donnie went on to be a, uh, an All-American uh, college hockey goalie. And he, we, he had a truck come down from Wallsburg, and we unloaded, I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds of bundles of hockey, Wally hockey sticks, in which he sold throughout New England right out of his garage in New Haven. Wow. Jeez. Wow. That is that is really interesting. I didn't know that. You know, Terry, I got a quick question for you. When you were talking about golf, right, you said the OHA. That was the Ontario Hockey Association, correct, which was a forerunner of the Ontario Hockey League that we know today? Yes. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to make sure on yeah, that the, one. The, the OHA was the premier uh, hockey in, in all of Canada. Even the guys from out west who played out in Manitoba and Saskatchewan and Alberta. If you were in any way connected with the six teams in the NHL and you were under their radar, they brought you – East and you played in Ontario. That's where you played. Mm, right. They had, a, they had a major junior A league, which are six teams. And then there was like three or four junior B leagues, of, of which I played two years with. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the best players came out of that and went to the NHL because the AHL at that time was kind of a down step for NHLers who were on their way out. Mm-hmm. And all the young guys and the OHA were the guys that actually moved up into the National Hockey League with the six teams at that time. Okay. Uh, oh. That's basically how it happened. They, the OHA was was the best hockey in Canada. And the, the Memo- if you yeah. were on, yeah. you were on a Memorial right. Cup team, you were golden. Yeah. Right. I was right. I was fortunate one year. The year well, two years I spent in Windsor, the Windsor Bulldogs were the senior team in the OHA there. So I got to practice quite often with this with the uh, uh, Windsor Bulldogs. There were three of us on the junior team that were selected. Yeah, we, we were selected to work out and practice with them. It, it kind of served like a, as a taxi squad. If they had injuries or something, we could step into the lineup. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were Allen Cup champions that year. They beat uh, they beat Winnipeg for the uh, Allen Cup that year. They had a really great team. I mean, it was good mm-hmm. hockey. But senior hockey in Ontario and junior hockey was premier in Canada. Yeah, yeah and it yeah. was so much different back then because the NHL teams, when it was the original six, actually owned their, their junior teams, right. correct? Right. In the, right. Which would have been the OHA. Well, I signed with the Rangers, and you had you had, right. you had the New York Rangers and the AHL. I think at the time, the Baltimore Clippers were their AHL team. Mm-hmm. And then you moved down to the Guelph Royals, and then there was two, three teams. I went to Tilsonburg first in, the, uh, in Ontario. That was their junior B club. And then I was sent to to Windsor to play with another club they had franchised. Uh, and that was it. That's all they had. Oh, so they didn't have the Kitchener Rangers at this time? No. Uh, okay. Well, huh. I was the 60 – the last season of Guelph was 60 uh, – that 62, 60 – the 63, 64 season. They moved – Guelph closed – uh, I think Guelph Memorial Gardens closed – had shut down their operations and the club moved to Kitchener Waterloo. They became uh, okay. the Kitchener Rangers. Mm-hmm. 
uh, because I got actually I got I was called up to Kitchener that following year in juniors and I had injured and I couldn't I couldn't even report so it was I was out injured and uh, unfortunately I never got to go and play in Kitchener. Yeah, I'm sure you sure as heck stayed in the game. That's for sure. Um, well, I, I've hung in there for a lot of years. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, a lot of I got, oh, <laughs> so I got a question for both Terry and Rocky. You know, everybody talks about you know the, today how you know the game is better than it's ever been and all that. And in some people's eyes, it, it certainly is, and it's certainly a great product nowadays. But what I want to know from both of you guys is what was better back then about hockey as opposed to the way it is today. And that, Rocky, I'll let you go first on this one. Well, one thing that bothers me, no one looks after their man, and the back passes are just driving me nuts. <laughs> yeah. we, were charged. we made a back pass, we were charged. Leave the puck there or let the guys skate into it. And you guys just talked about the Windsor Bulldogs. Well, I played for Capus Cation Senior Hockey Club. We beat them in 1961. And then we went to Montreal to play the Olympic team, and they beat us. That's how close we come to winning the All Ontario. Wow! We won All Ontario, wow. but we lost to the to, uh, uh, to the Quebec team. No kidding. That's that's really awesome. That's 1961. Wow! That's a big championship for our town. Nobody got paid. Everybody played for nothing. Everyone was given a job, and that's how we ended up in campus casing. But mind you, it was my hometown. Yeah, well, that had to be really, really awesome to be able to right there for your hometown. And they played for the love of the game. Well, Absolutely. Was so, it, it was yeah. very competitive in the <laughs> OHK. Then. Even in the senior league, it was very competitive in Ontario. So when Rocky speaks about campus casing playing Windsor, you know, that's a big deal. <laughs> that's a big deal to, to even have a shot at Thank getting you. to the yeah. Island Cup. They had a good team then that, that year, too, and we were fortunate yeah. to beat them. Well, I was there in 62, 63, and 63, 64. So the, the year they won it in the, the 63 Allen Cup, uh, Phil Watson was the coach. And they, had, they had some real – Wayne Rutledge was the goaltender, and uh, Jerry Service, Normie Foster. Uh, they had some really good players. Uh, and then the following year after that, they went into the International League in uh, 60, uh, 63, 60, uh, 62, 63, 64, they went into the International League uh, instead of the OHA. So uh, and a lot of those guys had, had left for other clubs. I have a question. St. Michael's was in the OHA, weren't they? Well, in, in, in my time, the six teams in the OHA were the Montreal Junior Canadiens. You know, you're only talking six teams that were hooked up with the six NHL clubs, the Montreal Junior Canadiens, the Peterborough Peets, Niagara Falls, Niagara Falls Flyers, Flyers. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hamilton Red Wings were in there, Guelph Royals, and uh, St. Catherine's Teepees. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of competition who, for jobs. And they became yeah. the, they be, later became the uh, St. Uh, St. Catherine's Blackhawks, I believe. But they were, that's with the six franchises of the big league club. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I have a yeah, friend Wayne Barco, who's a longtime coach and played for the Oakland Seals. His brother played for um, St. Michael's. Michael Urabaco. I don't know if you've ever played against him or what was the name again? It was Gene Urabaco. He was a coach. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And his brother Michael played for St. Michael's for a number of years, and he went up. I didn't know if you ever played against Michael or even Gene. Well, they had – see, you got to – they actually – Toronto, Toronto area had a junior league. They had a called Metro – they had a Metro Junior League. That was it. Okay. Just for the Toronto area, you know, uh, there, you know, there was probably six or eight teams in that Metro Junior League and, and just Toronto all by itself. The St. Mike's were one of them. Yeah. Uh, they were associated with, I think, St. Mike's College, I think, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But I see you got an NF hat on, so that's Niagara Falls Flyers. That's, uh, no, Newfoundland. Newfoundland. <laughs> Newfoundland, okay, okay. And play, with, play, with, play with some guys from Newfoundland, some good guys. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, I know you had somebody you wanted to show up. Yeah, on I screen. wanted to circle back to uh, Rocky was uh, describing Philadelphia Arena. It's the most unusual. I don't know if I can get if you can see this. Oh, yeah. 
if you can see the fans, the front row comes down to the top of the boards. It's the most unusual oh, setup shit. I've ever seen. And so, and you can see the pipes that, you know, uh, I know at least one of our guys, um, oh, I'm not going to remember his first name, Murray, played for the Clippers. He got his arm broken, uh, got run into the, run into one of those pipes uh, in Philadelphia. And, uh, but it's just, it's just the most, I've never seen a, an arena where the, the front seats, the, the seats are up above the boards to, to start. Right. It's it's just the weirdest. Uh, so anyway, I, I have no idea why they did it that way. But uh, so that was when Rocky was trying to explain it. That was I wanted to show a picture. Right. That must have felt like playing in Thunderdome too. Man, people on right on top. Like, <laughs> yeah, hey, you know. right. Cage, cage hockey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Terry, tell us how did you get your start with the EHL? Well, I, it's it's a funny story. I was playing junior hockey in, in Canada, and we had a week break for the holiday. I went home. I took a plane out of Detroit back to New York and then took a bus back to New Haven. And, uh, of course, Perry, I was I was still very good friends with Don. He called me and said, hey, he says, you're home? I said, yeah. He said, do you want to play some hockey? I said, where? He says, well, they got a team or an EHL team going to Russia. He said, and a lot of the players are going to be gone, so they're going to be short of guys, so they're looking for fill-ins. So I said, well, geez, I, you know, I don't know if I could do that. He said, well, right now, he said, they're, they're looking for guys in Philadelphia. And I didn't, first time I've ever been to Philadelphia, so I got down. I went down to Philadelphia. I hooked up, I went to, the arena was on 46th and Market, and Frank Lewis was the trainer. He met me there at the uh, real nice man. He lived in, he lived in a row housing, took me to his house and, uh, he said that half of the team left to go to play in, in, in Russia. He said, I didn't have any equipment. So, I, I, in fact, he had a, I had to sign a form that I'd return the skates that he gave me. <laughs> <laughs> here's a picture. Of, here's, a, here's what it says. You can see ramblers on the top of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I had to sign my life away for him to give me a pair of skates. The equipment they didn't care about the skates they did. I'm surprised they didn't make you leave collateral. <laughs> well, it was, it was funny. So then I, there was uh, there was a discussion whether I would lose my eligibility in the OHA. So you know right. they're pretty okay. strict. see they're pretty strict up in the OHA. You know you just can't jump club without being released from your home, from the club you play with. So it was I wasn't even gonna I wasn't even gonna play. So they said, well, come on the trip. It was a well, I remember it was a two-day trip. I think they went to Nashville and Knoxville. And it was uh, – I mean, it was like – there was only like 10, 10 guys available to play, maybe not even that many. It was like ridiculous. So we got there, and I said, look, I said, you know, I says, I, I don't have a release. I said, I don't want to lose my eligibility. So, well, don't worry about it. So you'll have an assumed name, and that's it. So that was so – that's, So that's why you don't show up in the paper. I looked yeah. at – for January 64, I saw yeah. all the transactions for Philadelphia. I went through every article. I went through the road teams, and I couldn't find your name. That's why I haven't I, – I've never yeah. found you. Wow. So the, wow. That's so that, that was it. I made the two-day road trip, and then I went back to uh, the Windsor. <laughs> but yeah. I ended up the next year, of course, in, in, what happened in the following season, the 64-65 season, Philadelphia Ramblers had went defunct and they were done. So they moved over to Cherry Hill, New Jersey in the Cherry Hill Arena and they became the Jersey Devils. And uh, oh, okay. Don, Don Perry again called me. He actually wanted me to come to the Ducks camp in Comac. But oh. I said, look, I, I looked at their roster. And I said, you know, they're loaded already. I said, there's no shot at even making that club. I mean, they ended up winning the league that, that, that year, 64-65. So he said, look, he said, I'll, I'll give a call to Pat Kelly, who was his friend. And he said, call Pat. I didn't, And I remember Pat when he played with the Greensboro Generals when I was a stick boy. And yeah. uh, he said, no, send him down. So I went, I drove down and uh, I ended up in a place called the Country Squire Motor Lodge. I think it was in, <laughs> Haddon, I think it was in Haddonfield. Yeah. <laughs> was I, I, all I knew was two routes there, Route 4 and Route 70. That's all I can remember about the major routes. Of course, the arena was on. I remember Grace Boulevard or something like yeah. that. Grace Grace, Grace, Grace Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. 
<laughs> so I hooked, so I went, I go, I, again, I go over there and again, there's Frank Lewis, the trainer, and Frank, of course, Frank runs everything. Frank's the glue that run the Ramblers. He's now the glue that's running the Jersey Devils. And we were staying at this country squire, and next door was the Latin Quarter, which was a nightclub. It was through yeah. the activity yeah. there was really something. And uh, I got to meet a lot of the players. Wayne Caulfield happened to be about a year and a half, maybe two years older than I was. So Wayne and I became friends, and uh, I roomed with a guy named Chris Finnerty. And next to, uh, next door, we had adjoining rooms that I think Art Hart was with. Uh, uh, with uh, Wayne uh, Caulfield at that time, so we shared rooms together. There's, yeah, that's Wayne. There he is, right there. Wayne, yeah, right there. Yeah. yeah. Grandfather, Wayne, of, Wayne. grandfather of Cole Caulfield. Yeah, no, Wayne is up. Uh, Wayne, Wayne came from the Sioux. I, I, that's where his family grew up in the Sioux, Sioux Saint Marie, Ontario, yeah. which is north, which is towards where Rocky lives. Uh, okay. But we, uh, we hit it off pretty good, and. Uh, what happened was is we were supposed to work out, start workouts the next day. We get to the this Cherry Hill Arena, and the, the ice equipment is shut down. They got no ice. So we go back to the motel, and uh, all of a sudden, Pat got the team together. They had a little restaurant uh, attached to the whole motel on the back. And the, the owner of the of the Jersey Devils came over. She was a young woman. Her name was Mrs. Miss Williams was her name. She was a, I don't think she was 25 years old. And she – talked to Pat and he then came back to us and he said, we're leaving in an hour. We're going over, to, we're going to Pennsylvania to have for training camp. So we jump on the bus and we go to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, yeah. which is King of Prussia. I think I remember reading the sign. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful old inn. It was like a civil war in, you know, it was, you were in real, some real tidy area in Pennsylvania. And they had a hockey rink, but it really wasn't a hockey rink. We get there and we find out that the boards were only like three feet high. And <laughs> the size of the rink wasn't an official 200 by 85. It might have been 175 by by 50. So it was it was a rinky-dink rink, to say the least. It was a, it was, when you say a band box, it was a band box. <laughs> so we ended up working out there for three or four days. And then uh, we the ice machine was ready. And so we go back to uh, the Cherry Hill Arena. And uh, lo and behold, uh, <laughs> the ice is soft as hell. The machine crapped down. We were supposed to play the Johnstown Jets that night, and the game got postponed. So uh, the next night we get on the bus, and, of course, the bus we used at the time uh, was the old Liberty Liberty Bowl school bus. It was a rickety old bus. had the picture of the Liberty Bell on the side of it. And, uh, you know, it only had about uh, 13, 14 seats, and then there was one rack in the back, and that was for the goaltender, our goaltender that, that year was Pat Rupp. And Pat Rupp was the only guy that was allowed to go lay in a racket. And the rest of us had to sit up and play. Well, I learned how to play Bure card game. Bure is a <laughs> Canadian game, which is equal to set, setback in America. So I got to play, learn how to play Bure. But it was funny because Reggie Mazurf, Reggie had not shown up for training camp because he was still playing in the Canadian Football League. Right. And him and Art Hart were real close. Art was another veteran of the team. And uh, by the way, probably the fastest skater I ever saw. There, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> and he's he's is he like the great uncle, maybe grandfather of um, the Flyers goaltender uh, Carter Hart. You know, he could be. Uh, I, there was I think he, he, there was he's two of them. I, I forgot to be. Grandfather. Art, I, I, Art had a Art had a brother. I never met his brother. But Art, yeah. Art was not only the, one of the best players on the team, he drove the team bus <laughs> wherever you went. When we got on the bus and went to Johnstown, which is we headed out over through uh, over the Walt Whitman Bridge and then headed out to like a six, seven hour ride. Out Johnstown is like 10 miles outside of uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, That's right. before we got over, we got over the bridge and, and Pat said, Art said to Pat, Kelly, Pat was sitting right on the other side of me. He says, I think I know where Reggie might be. He said, well, I called his wife, and she said he's not home from the football, Canadian Football League. So we're going to stop and we're going to start. We're going to stop in South Philly. So we diverted off the, the highway, went down to South Philly, stopped at a couple of bars. Lo and behold, there was Reggie. Wow. <laughs> so 
Pat says, load them on the bus, load them on the bus. And off we go to Johnstown and we get to Johnstown and we went to this, this bar there called Tops. And Reggie was sitting next to me and he said, stay with me, kid. I'll teach you everything you need to know about Johnstown. I said, oh, oh boy. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to argue with a guy that's good. They've got like 15 years in this league. No, I'm not going to argue. So we get there, and there's probably 50 women all dressed in the nines. Reggie, Reggie, they're yelling at the bosses. <laughs> and, he, I mean, he just like emanated his his love for all these women. They all loved him. So, what was he, like the we, Derek Sanderson of the EHL? Oh, he was just something else. Reggie was just something else. I mean, he was just a, a guy that. Not only a great, he was a great hockey player, but he's also he was a great, great hockey player. Yeah. He was a great was football player name? too, and I never yeah. saw him play football. Yeah. I mean, they what say he was a great last name. Reggie Missouri. Missouri. Oh, okay, Reggie. I have a friend. I'll be seeing him next month. He's coming up here again. Reggie Kent, who played for Johnstown. Did you ever play with Reggie? Probably he's played a very against good him. Friend he of mine. He been like well, what, I re- what I remember about that night, that night, that game that night, we went to the to the Cambria War Memorial. Gunnar Garrett was the uh, trainer for the Johnstown Jets, and Gunnar met us, showed us our dressing room, hooked us up with whatever we needed supplies, and then uh, we went out and played the game. It was a, John, the Cambria War Memorial was a very nice rink. It was uh, mm-hmm. it was it was like a little NHL rink. It was very well kept, yep. colorful, all blue, and you could tell that they. They had pride in that town, that uh, that that hockey arena. But uh, yeah, the only thing I really recall out of that game is, is I circled the net with the puck, looking at stuff went by the goaltender and, and Tony Bukovic cross-checked me across my Adam's apple. I thought I swallowed my Adam's apple. Oh, man. Wow! I mean, he came right across. He was a defenseman for Johnstown Jets, and he uh, yeah. he leveled me. He leveled me. Yeah, size fella. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, you guys, you had mentioned Wayne Caulfield earlier, and, and I'm sure if anybody asked him, Cole got his scoring touch from him, right? Well, he, <laughs> Wayne, Wayne had great, I mean, Wayne had great hands. I mean, um, yeah. You maybe. know, the game back, the game sure, back uh, then was hands. The, the, the whole thing, the, yeah. yeah, the whole family, I mean, certainly Wayne down to his children and, and around yeah. Milwaukee, they're just, you know, uh, hockey royalty right around there. And, you know, so, and then of course, they passed it on to to Cole. Right. And, uh, oh no, Cole he's a just, he's a great player. He's a Cole great. Cole keeps everything up. I mean, he just he's just yeah. a hockey sponge, and uh, no, yeah, it's, it's amazing. amazing. It, it really yeah. is. And and I I wasn't meaning that in a disparaging way. I just you know kind of a yep. That's where that's where he gets it from. It's for me because I know that's exactly what Gump would do if I actually had anywhere near <laughs> that talent. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't matter. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Speaking well, of Gump, I know he's got a question for you. Yeah, I got a question for you guys. Back in the sixties to sixty five, say. I spent a lot of time at Clinton Arena uh, watching the Comets play, and I was very familiar with the EHL. A matter of fact, all we, all us kids got together. We all, we all took a team, Johnstown Jets, Greenboro's Generals, all them guys. And uh, one of the things we did, I, I, I have to ask you, I cannot remember, was there ever a Canadian team in that EHL at that time? No. Gangston. Gangston. Not that I remember. I, I, don't, I don't remember either. I'm, I've been racking my brains. I listened. I, no, I heard no, Rocky just never, said Kingston. Yeah. Between 54 yeah. and 73, there was, in fact, I don't think there was ever a uh, Canadian, even going back to 33, I don't think there was ever a Canadian team. Um, you know, um, I mean, most of the players but, were Canadians. Right. But, but, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I don't know. I don't know. No, there, there weren't any Canadian teams uh, until it broke off into the North American Hockey League. And then uh, they okay. the Boche Yeah. Because you, um, he mentioned, you mentioned a lot of Canadian teams. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking, holy mackerel, I don't ever remember seeing one play. No. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, I have a 1969 hockey news in front of me. And in the Eastern League, there was Long Island, New Haven, Johnstown, Syracuse, Clinton, New Jersey, Charlotte, Suncoast, Greensboro, uh, Roanoke, and Jacksonville. You see, that's 69. There's a lot of teams. There's a lot yeah. of teams. It should have been 71 if Suncoast was in it. So 71, 72. Let's see. So, but Suncoast is St. Petersburg, Florida. 72, 72. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. I, I that was driving me crazy because I heard you mention so many you know, he, uh, uh, yeah, well, Canadian teams. Oh, OHA teams. He was mostly right. Into. 
to. Right. right. Yeah, that's you're right though. It's when you think about it, there wasn't any. You're, you're I, right. I, I've been going cr- and I used to go to all the games. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. And did you go to all Terry's afterwards? Uh, yeah. No, we used to go to the, the Golden Teeth Hot Inn. That's where I got in trouble. Uh, <laughs> we won't talk about that. Yeah, no. Uh, Leo, did you know in 1972, Comet celebrated their 44th birthday? Wow. Uh, to tell you the truth, no, I was I was overseas in the service. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I just read this out. Uh, so, well, on that break, guys... If you oh, even sorry. go back earlier to the beginnings, uh, when I started as a, as a rink rat and a stick boy in the Haven Arena, um, that first championship year, I mean, I think there was only five or six teams in the Eastern Hockey League at that time. Uh, yeah. There wasn't yeah, many. Between, there was, yeah, there between wasn't 55 and 60, there were 16, or 55 yeah. and 59, there were six teams, and then yeah. they added oh. – uh, Greensboro and uh, Long Island. At well, the, there, there's so, there, there's even with a the the small point. amount of teams, at, you know, I can understand with expansion, it, it kind of gets watered down. But there was a lot of great players when I was a stick oh. boy. I, I mean, I, I can remember one memorable night. I can remember I was stick boying for uh, uh, the Charlotte Clippers were coming to town. The problem mm-hmm. is there was a blizzard going on it in in the New England area, and they were delayed. They couldn't get to the get into the Haven. And they didn't arrive until uh, probably 10, 1030 that night. The game didn't start till 11. Oh, it ended like one. But I'll oh. tell you, everybody stayed. All the fans stayed because the yeah. was, was a crazy crowd. And yeah. uh, I can remember we went out after the game because I had to load the, the bags back. They didn't They didn't travel by bus. They had four brand new, I think, 1956 Ford Fairlane, Fairlanes. That's what they traveled in. Oh, wow. They had, they had four cars. Yeah. Now they were parked in front of the arena, and you couldn't even get out of the building with so much snow from this <laughs> blizzard. So Joe Dill said, Joe Small ran the arena grill, and he said, look, I got food here. You guys stay here all night. And uh, John Muckler was the player coach. John said, oh, wow. no wow. way. We're, we're playing in Clinton tonight. That's, we're talking 2 o'clock in the morning now. He says, right, no, right. we got a game in Clinton tonight. Right. They went on the road, and I don't know where they got to or how they got to Clinton, but they evidently did. Yeah. Well, did Rocky, did you ever get to the travel in the Ford Fairlanes, or was it all bus for you? Pardon? Did you ever get to travel in any of the Ford Fairlanes, or was it all bus for you? Yeah, that was that was the Clippers, Charlotte Clippers. Okay. Yeah. We we started traveling with the vehicles, and then they they got a bus later on. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's that's cool. the same bus I was on. The Liberty yeah. Yeah. And you guys are talking about uh, a Canadian team playing in the, in the AHL and Kingston in in the fifty five before fifties they were playing in that league. Okay. Well, they would play Clinton. They were they were, they would play Clinton. There were there were a lot of uh, no, they were they were playing in that league though. Right, I knew Clinton when they when they uh, they were in two leagues at one point. Right, it, the, I think it was the Eastern Ontario Hockey League at fifty four fifty five. They yes. they played two leagues. Um, That's right. So wow. EHL yeah. and then also uh, so yeah, and then they went EHL exclusively, I believe, after that. Yeah, if, if yeah, serves. exactly. Yep. Cool. So, uh, oh, that, so, oh, I'm sorry, Terry. What was that? A cl- the comments had some uh, again. I. I Again, I stick for them too. So I mean, the Defalese brothers, Angie and, De- and Norman, Normie, the Norm. goaltender. No, yes, he was. Uh, Normie to me was the best goalie I ever saw in the Eastern Hockey League. Uh, no question about it. Yeah. That guy was amazing. He was just, uh, he stopped him with his face. I mean, it, yes, it, he did. Uh, Which was a very well, dangerous thing to do back then. He so, got cut one night. He caught a skate across his face in the Haven one night. They had to take him in. And, and they thought, of course, they thought the trainer was going to gear up and come on the ice, and he didn't. He comes back. I mean, he's got stitches and bandages. He looked like a mummy. He goes back on the net after after they stitched them all up. He never got replaced. Uh, but his brother Angie, Willie Paul Chuck, was a good guy. He was a good uh, good uh, offensive school goal scorer for the Clinton Comets, as I remember. Indian Joe Nolan was my probably my most favorite my favorite uh, guy. He was wow. just uh, he was just. It was a gentle giant, but you didn't mess with him. <laughs> and Ian, of course, Ian, Ian Anderson was a guy that you know what nobody wanted to touch. No, uh, that's not. Nice. Yeah, you you were definitely taking your life in your own hands. You do that. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, guys, we're going to do a quick commercial break. So, um, like we always do, we always end the first part before we go to commercial break with our Zambo, or I'm sorry, our, our breakaway trivia. And breakaway trivia oh. is brought to you by the Red and White Zamboni Ice Machine, which is a book by a friend of the show, Jimmy Iceman McNeil, who you might know from the, the Drive Across or Drive for Gold when he went across Canada in Zamboni. And you can get his book if you email him at Mac underscore Iceman at hotmail.com. And I've also got that up on our website, Marty's Illegal Stick.com. So with that said, the breakaway trivia question is. Who is the NHL leader all time in penalties in minutes? The answer when we come back. Oh, that's Blake Ball. Visit My Little Falls and stay connected with the latest news, information, and events in the city and the area. Our mission is to generate interest in the community and connect residents in a more meaningful way by facilitating deeper conversations about how these stories will shape the future of the Mohawk Valley. Join thousands of weekly visitors who stay up to date with feature stories, interviews, videos, our event calendar, and print publication, the Mohawk Valley Express. It's about timely local news for the community, keeping citizens informed about important issues, telling about the people who live and work here, and giving locally owned business the opportunity to reach a very targeted audience of locals and tourists alike. It's a whole new form of media-rich content developed specifically for today's mobile lifestyle and listeners. You can download our iOS app in the iTunes Store, listen to our country music streaming radio station, or sign up for our weekly newsletter. Stop by today at MyLittleFalls.com. You'll be glad you did. Wow, I see our producer, Dave the Save, has been busy making a video commercial. Guys, that, this is the first time we ever had a video commercial like that. So I, never seen that. Yeah. I was kind of captivated by the whole thing myself. Wow. So, <laughs> so I thought he's gotten younger. Yeah. <laughs> and he's so here. before we get back into our chat about the EHL, I want to go over our answer for breakaway trivia. And the question was. Who is the NHL leader all time in penalties and minutes? And as we always do, Gump, we're going to you first. I knew it. I knew it. Okay, guys, you're going to get a good laugh out of this one. No, uh, gonna get it. I'm going to go with Muhammad Ali. He played for the no. Islanders. And I, I don't know. No. Well, he actually did fight Dave Semenko once. Yeah. The Edmonton Oilers. Yeah. I, I have no idea. Okay, so I'll take that as a no answer. Yeah. Rocky, got any idea who it is? Pardon? Tiger Williams. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Tiger Williams. Tiger Williams. Oh, I, I, oh. Just said, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, the, the answer to breakaway trivia. Who is the NHL leader in all time in penalty in minutes? Tiger, Tiger Williams. Ooh, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Barry, who do you think? Yep, the Tiger. Okay. Terry. He was the talking, he, talking he was Eastern the hockey? No, nope, NHL. 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 Well, yeah, uh, he was in the NHL. It had to be somebody early on with a lot of longevity that played a lot of years. <laughs> and who uh, got into a lot of fights. Well, yeah, Brophy coached in the NHL. Great. Does that count? Brophy was probably the <laughs> leader in all the hockey for <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody topped him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom. You got to well, go. He was an NHL or he coached uh, um, the you know, Maple Leafs. Uh, <laughs> so the answer is Dave Tiger Williams. And Tiger Williams. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I forgot all about him. He had a yeah. total of 3,971 penalty minutes wow. in his NHL career. Can you believe yes. that? Tiger Williams. Boy. Good job, Rocky. But, Watch him play for years. But, Tom, I'll put you on the spot. Is, is there a record for the EHL for that or – Oh, it's got to be Brophy. And, yes, and, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and it, the last season of the Devils, they had Jim Hay, the last couple of seasons, they had Jim Hay as coach, who was, I believe, the second all-time penalty guy in the Western Hockey League before he came over to the EHL. So they were a defensive pairing. Um, now, of course, they were both, you know, like late 30s, early 40s at that point. But mm -hmm. um, still – Plenty of penalty minutes at, at that point. So, uh, <laughs> plenty enough to go around, right? Yeah, but I, yeah, I'm, I, I'd be shocked if it, if it wasn't Brophy. <laughs> oh, well, we'll have to look that up. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, Terry or Rocky, did either of you guys play against Brophy at all? 
I was on the ice with him just once, and I never want to be on oh, the I ice again. Yeah. Again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I played uh, oh. against Brophy for four years. Oh, oh. yeah. How'd that go? He was a tough cookie. Yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. Oh, you had to keep your stick up all the time. He yeah. was tough. <laughs> and put your head on a swivel, right? Well, he right. was a master. With, he, was, he was probably the mastered swordsman of all hockey. Uh, yeah. 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 Not, mm -hmm. You know, not if you talk to any of the posing forwards that had to go around the front of the net when he was playing D, I mean, if you didn't get speared or you didn't get butt-ended in the ribs <laughs> or you yeah. didn't get hacked and chopped down to size, uh, he'd try to take your head off. I mean, he was just that type of a player. I happened to go on the ice with him just once, and that, that was a year, two, like two years after. One year after juniors, I had gone to, ended up going to Long Island's camp, and uh, I think he was still there. I could have been in New Haven. I just don't recall, but I remember taking – Don Perry was there in any case, and I took a face off with him. I think it was in a practice session. And he came right up to me, and he whispered in my ear, he said, kid, I'm going to take your left ear off. And Don, <laughs> Don Perry, Don Perry saw it. He came over. He came over to him. He says, "Back off." That's all he had to say to him, and he did. He backed off. But it was during a practice session. I don't know whether he was in New Haven at the time or whether it was in Long Island. I just don't recall that one time that I had that set to John Brophy. <laughs> Wow. I'm not sure. What, I'm not even sure what year it was, but he played in the Haven for a while. It could have been in the Haven. No, a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah, and he would. He, believe it or not, he made it all the way up into the well, NHL. See, I too. used to. I used to. I was. I practiced when I was in high school. I was in high school all state or in all New England, and I was. I was Red McDonough coached the Wilbur Cross team in the Haven, and Red was a former official, and he also played with the Haven Blaze at one time in his career. And he was really close with, with right. Don Perry. Him and him and Red McDonough were tight as can be. And we'd practice in the arena, my West Haven team. We'd practice from 6 to 7 in the morning. And then Red would allow me to go on with his Wilbur Cross team from 7 to 8. And then he, he one day, we just out, out of curiosity, I said, do you think you can get me on with the plays? He said, sure. I said, I'll get you on. You want to stick around? I said, what are you going to do about school? He said, look, I'm going down to the back of the arena. They got a pay booth over there. I'll call my mother. I put a dime in. Called her, and it, it, back in those days, if you took the phone and just let it hang, no one could ever call or so, call the house, so the truant officer could never look for me. So I would, <laughs> so I would, I would skate with the blades quite a bit when Don Perry was here. Yeah. And even when Wally Coleman, Wally Coleman came on, uh, uh -huh. his player coach, and Wally was another great guy, uh, and he was built like Rocky. He was a you know a stout, tough hockey player, uh, Wally Coleman, and you didn't mess with him. Yeah, wow. Wally, Rocky, Wally, did you go up against Wally? I, I just practiced with the blades against him. When I, when I was in yeah. high school, he let me come on and practice with the blades. So I, I, he used to have, of course, he always had a cigar like red chomping out of the side of his mouth. But he was just a, he was a, a great hockey mind. So I got to learn a lot as a young as a young hockey high school player at the time. You know, the tutelage, you know, what they taught you was just amazing. You know. And what a great experience that must have been, just being a high school player, being able to get on the, on the ice with, with the team like that. Well, I was fortunate. I had friends in that in Haven Arena when I became a rink rat. And, uh, you know, they took care of the kids. You got to remember, you're talking about the Zamboni thing. I mean, before the Zamboni came along, I remember we used to scrape ice with big steel scrapers yeah, yeah. with two oh, wooden yeah. handles on them. Mm -hmm. And then we, we had a 55-gallon drum that we had to drag around the ice. You had to fill it up with hot water to put a new oh. surface down. You dragged it around the surface to put a new coat of ice on it between periods. And I recall that when the ice capades, and I think Nate Podoloff started the ice capades because I remember there were two girls in the Haven Arena, uh, Beth Hoffman and Patty Panzak. Patty's father, uh, George Panzak, was the head usher for the Haven Arena. And I think he convinced... Uh, they paddle off to start the ice capades, and that's how they got their their start. And they used to ship in these fifty five gallon barrels of white paint. I, I thought I always said it was white paint, but it was some special mixer you had to put down for when the ice capades and the ice uh, ice follies were in town. So it was, but we made all the ice by hand then, scraped the ice, 
and put the new surfaces down before the Zamboni came over. Wow. Wow. And I bet you that was not easy work to drag that, that drummer around. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I know, I'm not sure the year that that New Haven actually started with the Zamboni. That I know, I can recall a year or two, we, we did all the scraping and, and surface the ice with that 55 gallon drum of hot water. And then, uh, then the Zamboni came on. Johnny Moore was the head, uh, head maintenance guy. He, he had, he was the one that drove the Zamboni for the years to go after that. Uh, but that first Zamboni was was a crude crude kind of a machine at one time, you know. Oh sure, yeah, they were basically just Jeep chassis, really. And then, uh, so Barry, you said you found the answer. Yeah, John Brophy, three thousand <laughs> eight hundred three thousand eight hundred and thirty nine minutes and penalties. Wow! 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 He got somebody against Ian Anderson and Clinton. Oh, I bet you those are some battles, huh? <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, man. Of course, when I found it out, they combined the totals for John while he played in the EHL and the IHL. So I, I have no idea how many minutes he picked up. He, you know, he probably didn't pick up too many in the IHL, but. <laughs> how, right. many, how many of those old Comet players are still around? How many are. So there's, uh, uh, what, yep, probably about four or five right here in the area. Yeah, Pete yeah. Prevost. Uh, Bordy Smith still around. Yeah. Yeah. Bordy Smith. Bordy Smith's alive. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a there's eleven there's eleven comments mm -hmm. in our Facebook group, the Eastern yeah. Hockey League Facebook group. So and Van Kelly was just in Fort Wayne the other night. He he handed out his uh, the trophy, the Pat Kelly trophy, to Fort Wayne Comets when they won the championship. Um, he he was looking pretty good too. Uh, I'm sorry. Who was that? After the, the Eastern, go ahead. I'm sorry. The, the year before COVID, there on the, at uh, the Utica Auditorium, they had the uh, four of them. I forgot, I forgot all four, four names now, but there there was four comments there. Jack when Armstrong. they raised the banner up for when they went, what was it? 50, 50 it was the fiftieth anniversary of the sixty seven sixty eight season. I think, yeah, yeah, but they, they only lost five games all year. Yeah. Uh, that, that was, that was amazing. A, they were honored that night, and they they put a statue out in front. That was fantastic. Yeah. 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 Actually, if you guys haven't seen that statue they got out for, I'll have to get a picture of it and put it on the, the website because it, it really is. Yeah, it's a, it's exactly. a really nice schedule or a nice uh, schedule. Looking at this, <laughs> it's a nice statue. So, uh, you know, it's funny because when Tom was on a few weeks ago, and I had no idea that he knew about the Cherry Hill Arena, and I thought I was pulling this big coup by having it for the Zamboni <laughs> time machine. Well, that kind of backfired right in my face, but that's okay. So we got to talking about this arena, and the more we talked about it, the more you know, like Tom, you and I talked, you know, yeah, it was a dump, but it was our dump kind of deal. Right. Yeah. So so what I want to know from, from Rocky and Terry, because I'm sure, you know, both of them played there too. How bad was that ice tilted as far as having to skate uphill? Because that always kind of seemed part of the research. Well, because we're the home club, we had the advantage of playing two periods going downhill. <laughs> 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 you well, got to look for, I mean, for two periods, that was, right? That's a, that was the good thing about being at home. <laughs> the game that I did play at home there against the New York Rovers, it's like I didn't understand why the ice was tilted the way it was. It's like, my God. <laughs> wow. You could feel it. Yeah. How about you, Rocky? What were your impressions? But, well, to me, all, all, uh, all ice is very hard to keep, you know, in good shape because of uh, – the temperatures in the buildings and they're heated, they're not heated. I know we have so many problems here in campus casing because we're talking 40 and 50 below outside. And then we put a little heat inside and it doesn't take long for the ice to get soft. So hmm. soft ice is good for figure skaters, but bad for hockey players. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I always wondered because of that, that first season there, and uh, they had the trouble with the ice making machines. Whether something happened with the floor actually, and uh, it maybe it developed some cracks, and they never made the proper repairs with the floor. Right. I think, I think made, they did later on, and because when, once when I was playing there, I don't think it was quite was that bad. bad. I think they they finally uh, did some repairs on it, but um, I don't know. It is, but it's, but it's still interesting. Though. I wasn't, I wasn't good enough skater to know the difference. So, <laughs> Gary, you were talking about the comets outside the War Memorial here in um, Utica. 
they had a huge tribute for them. They made a huge bronze um, trophy outside. This is there. It is in oh, remembrance of the uh, yeah. Clinton Comets. It's a lot. You know, you could actually sit down. It's huge, and yeah, you know, it's like to do that yeah. for a team and to remember them. That that was so great. And you know what's great is on any given game night for the, the current Utica Comets, you can see people just getting their picture taken with that all the time. And it's such, yeah. such a special thing. It, it really is. Yeah. They'll never be forgotten. No. Never. Mm-hmm. Never. Absolutely you know, not. Just a, a side note about your comments. Um, after the Eastern Hockey League went defunct, uh, I think it was, was it 73? 73, what, 73 yeah. Yep. Yeah, they split. I, the 70, uh, we had – I was playing in the, what they called the Northeast uh, U.S. Hockey League. Um, there were six teams, and uh, a lot of those players from the Comets became members of the Copper City Chiefs out of Rome, New York. Oh, yeah. 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 And they, we played them in the Kennedy Arena that during the, we had a it was oh. a good it was a good it was a six team semi pro league with a lot of ex EHLers, European players, college players, all American. It was a a whole slew of great hockey players. Yeah. And it was a six team circuit that we, we ran for two years. We were in that league for two years. I played with a team called the Manitouk Blues, which were out of Cheshire, Connecticut. Cheshire had built a brand new skating center. And Jack Leach took over as manager. And Jack Leach was uh, Brian Leach's father. Wow. Oh, wow. Boy, Jack, was, uh, Jack was an All American hockey player at Boston College. He also played on the U.S. national team. So we started the Manitouk Blues team, and we entered this in this Northeast U.S. Hockey League, and uh, the Copper City Chiefs were – they ended up becoming the champions one year. Yep. But they we played in that Kennedy, Kennedy Arena in yep. New, New York. Hmm. And they, they actually – they went on to win the uh, United States Amateur National Championship one of the years, the Copper City Chiefs. But they had a lot of ex comic players playing on that team. Yeah, sure. It sure. was so funny. I just posted about five or six photos from the Copper City Chiefs on my really? – Because um, wow. I, I was in the Air Force back then, and we used to play hockey every noontime. And we used to have players from the Copper City Chiefs coming Jesus, down. Do you, got, do you have any stories or any new media stuff from that from that team? Well, I have tons. Really- well, like, yeah. Yeah, if I you don't see it. I have a arena I built up in my attic, a hockey rink, and I have over a thousand items from every single minor league team, junior team. Um, and I'll tell you is- what, if you, if you get have uh, uh, Scott get your email, send it to me. I will send you that six team league with all the rosters of all the players, yeah, all I the have, rinks, yeah. all the rinks we played in, and. Uh, You'll recognize a lot of those players, I'm oh, sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. You probably played uh, Ronnie Scales, uh, Steve Shablock. Uh, there's so many of the – and they used to be called up to the Mohawk Valley Stars when they were in the Atlantic Coast Hockey League. A lot of those players yeah. used to come down. Yeah. Another player that played – you may have played with them. He was in um, the movie Slapshot, Ned Dowd. He played for the Copper City Chiefs. Okay, Yep. And yes, his, his, yeah, his they, 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 they were, they were, the were league, they were league champs uh, the two yep. years that I was we played against them that in that league. But it was a good yeah. league. I mean there was, you know, the Matatuck yeah. Blues and Coho Americans were out of Long Island and they were a predominantly uh ex European pros that played with the Coho yeah. Americans and uh, of course we had the New Jersey Rockets were from South Mountain, South Mountain, it's not close to you. Is it down South Mountain Arena, West Orange, New Jersey? That's farther up north, I believe. South, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, wow. what, what team was you, were you playing when you played the Copper City Chiefs? We were playing, we were called the Matatuck Blues. We, we were out of okay. Cheshire, Connecticut. Okay, and New Jersey Rockets were from uh, South Mountain Arena in West right. Orange, New Jersey, right. Coho Americans. High Lawn Jerseys were a team, really, of all Clarkson and St. Lawrence players from college. Oh, they, yes. they played in, they played out of Lennox, Mass. Uh, and then, of course, we, the Bergen Brewers, were, who we had played against previously as the Newark Brewers, became the Bergen right. Brewers. They right. built a new – they built a, a mall, and they moved from the Newark Arena to the Bergen Mall. We played in that Newark Arena against that same Newark Brewer team. I mean, we had to get a police escort 
The cops would wait for us for the game to end. And the fans there were just the most brutal people you ever saw in your life. All they wanted to see fights. So, of course, we accompanied them and gave them the fights they wanted. But the, the police had to scorch out of that newer hockey. Wow. Ring. It was called wow. the Iron. I remember it was called the Iron Bound Arena. That's what it was called. Oh yeah, it was, yeah, in, a, yeah. It was in a dumpy neighborhood, and it just was no place to stop at a traffic light. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, guys, you know, I tell you, we're just we're scratching the surface here, and but I I really hate to do this because we as we had talked before, we were in kind of a hard deadline as far as time goes for this particular week, and of course we had all the technical difficulties to start off, so we kind of lost some time. But if you guys would like to come back next week to continue our discussion, that would be great. Uh, I'd love to have you guys back on if you're willing Tom, to come back. Tom, before you sign off, can I show you a couple of patches? Tom might yeah. be interested in doing some research. Oh, yeah. good, Absolutely. A good, a good friend of mine I played hockey with in Canada, his father was a hockey player in Canada. Yeah, he called me last week. He says, I got a couple of patches for you for Maroon. your collection. I said, really? So he sent me these. I just got them today in the mail. Wow. That, Look at that. that Wow. That was Montreal thought, Maroons, Maroons. 34-35. Yeah. Man. That, he, that, wrote that. A little, he wrote a little note to me. He said they were Stanley Cup champions that year. And Toe Blake, who was a friend of his father, was a member of that team. So he suspected, and he wasn't sure, but he said probably Toe Blake gave him this patch. Wow. So, man. so. Wow, And he's going wow. to send – he has other ones. He's, gonna, he's finding them from his father's uh, – Father passed away a good number of years ago, but he said, I still have gone through my father's stuff. And uh, that's incredible. That is absolutely that's incredible. incredible. Well, that's a, that's an amazing piece of, mm. of hockey. Yeah. Well, I guess no it doubt. is. Boy, oh boy, I tell you. And he's going to say, he said he'd send me others. So hopefully, me next time we come out, I'll have some others. He had, it's going through his dad's stuff. So he's, right. well, and I hope you keep us updated on that too. Yeah, but I, I hadn't, it, I just got it in the mail today. So I didn't have yeah. a chance to even reference it, but he wrote me a little note and said they were the Stanley cup champions that year. Sure. And, uh, told Blake was a member of the team and he was good friends with his father. Wow. He said, I think he probably got it from Toe Blake. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That is really awesome. So, yeah, I mean, if you guys are willing to come back next week, yeah. I'd love to have you back and, um, you know, I'll see if I can find a, a former Clinton comment to come on as well. We'll uh, we'll yeah. continue this discussion, and this has been so much fun, guys. I really appreciate you coming yeah. on. But like I say, unfortunately, we're kind of at the at the end of our time for now. But we'll we'll continue this next week. Cool. So, I, like I said, I thank all you guys for your time. You know, Tom, Barry, you know, Terry, Rocky, we really appreciate you coming on, you guys. And um, you know, so we'll uh, same bad time, same bad channel next week. How's that sound? Great. Hey, great. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. thanks for having us on. Thanks. Oh, absolutely. Can you give me his email so I can send him some of the old uh, yep. uh, Papa City Chiefs team photos? I absolutely will, Barry. Right. No problem. Yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and in fact, I will send you the rosters and the, you know, the ranks and the teams that were in that league because uh, oh, I, wow. I had copies from all of them. But I don't have a lot of media other than some newspaper, a few newspaper articles yes. right there. Right. Um, Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, guys. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's, uh, and that's all the time we've got for this week. But these uh, same gentlemen will be back next week, and we are, will continue our discussion about the EHL and old-time hockey in general. So for Gump, Leo Kinville, Dave the Save Warner, and his lovely wife has jumped into assist with us today. <laughs> I'm Scott Kinville. I want to let you know that you can find us at www.martyslegalstick.com. And you can also find us on YouTube and all major podcast platforms under the My Little Falls banner. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at Marty's Illegal Stick Hockey Podcast. So that's it for this week. I want to thank you guys for listening. And these same gentlemen will be back next week. So please tune back in next week. Um, like I said, I'm Scott Kimball. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.